Now here is a third class of classical groups, which has you know a Greek name meaning weaving, symplectic. And they're very important to us because all of mechanics, so everything you do, do about describing celestial motions or robots or you know all classical mechanics, anything that's energy preserving uh, has that form. And that comes from uh, you know the reason why it belongs to this classical group that when people write Newton's equation as a first order equation, they write x dot our velocity is a derivative of a Hamiltonian function. So function is Hamilton's function that we often call Hamiltonian. So this is just function that says, you know, kinetic energy plus potential energy is total energy stuff. So this energy, this function just has values in numbers. But if you take derivatives of it in any mechanical system, then you find out that uh, your velocity of motion is obtained by taking derivative of the Hamiltonian in this way. And if you take uh, change in momentum, in other words, acceleration, the force, that's obtained by taking minus derivative of this function with respect to coordinate. And you know this because you know you have learned that kinetic energy looks like that, for example. And uh, when you have separable Hamiltonians. So this one is picking out, it says, you know, my velocity is proportional to momentum, and this one says my acceleration is proportional to gradient of potential. So you know all this. But the important thing is this minus sign. If I decide to put these two guys here, and I put them in a little vector, let's call them Q. Q and P, and call this a two-dimensional vector. Well two times the dimensional vector. So if I goes from one to the number of degrees of freedom, for example, motion in the plane has two positions and two momentum velocities, all along four variables. Thing you care about is a matrix that looks like that. Because you can write this law saying that x dot i, which is, you know, pairs of these guys, uh, coordinate momentum pairs dot. You can write them as a matrix, I don't know what, j. Derivative with respect to q, derivative the first guy, derivative with respect to second guy. If this matrix has form 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, and then zeros every place else. Because if you multiply this combination of derivatives of the Hamiltonian, you know, they will take care of uh, the relative respect to Q showing up here is a minus sign, and the relative respect to P showing up here. So the structure uh, of uh, that's being preserved by Hamiltonian evolution is not length of some vector. You know, before we had this idea that when we rotated something we have to preserve its Euclidean length. But when you have a mechanical system, you have a different situation. You move 
to the phase space, which is half of its coordinates, half of its momenta. And what's being preserved is this combination, uh, which is, you know, when I multiply X transpose times this matrix X. And when I put all these double vectors, I find out what's really being preserved is combinations of Qs and Ps. So then in mechanics, you learn what's being preserved is the phase space volumes and areas. That's what this means. In other words, in mechanics, you're not preserving you know, you don't have a chronic or delta, but you have this anti-symmetric form, anti-symmetric uh, matrix that's invariant. And now you would like to change coordinates in phase space in such a way that you don't change your mechanical system. And that means uh, if I change x to s of x, this is now a matrix which is two times D, this D number. I would like to have uh, the same invariant here. In other words, I would like to have X, J transpose, I'm sorry, S transpose J. Uh, Sx. I would like this to be the same as the original phase space form. And that now gives you a rule that says that that's done as long as the matrix st times this form, you know, in for unitary groups, this was identity, this thing here. I mean, for orthogonal groups. For unitary groups, you require that this thing is identity, but now you require that your matrix is such that it preserves the phase space volume, you know, pairwise relation between moment, etc. So these matrices are called symplectic matrices. And, you know, you think you haven't seen them, but actually you see them always in mechanics, uh, any canonical transformation. So any change of coordinates when you're trying to solve your mechanical system. For example, you go from Cartesian coordinates to polar, so you can solve some problem of rotation or something. The transformation has to be canonical, meaning it has to be satisfied this symplectic condition. So this is called canonical transformation. This group now is called symplectic group in uh, two times to be consistent. D where D is the number of your coordinates and number of momenta. So two is doubles the size of the space. So now we have the three classical groups. We have orthogonal groups. We have unitary groups. And we have symplectic groups. And they have a property that you can make, uh, you know, depending on your problem, the dimension of problem can be as big as you want it to be. So in mechanics, you know, you can take three bodies and they can be in three dimensional coordinate and momentum space. So each one of them carries six dimensions. So you're in nine dimensions and then you have to worry about what's invariant and not to solve the problems. But basically, these are all classical groups. And these are the groups that mostly we encounter in science and engineering. You know, the exceptional groups, I don't want you to worry about at all at this time. <laughs>